So, uh, welcome to everybody to the panel B, the panel on value chains and sustainable uh, footprints. So I will uh, just introduce the the structure of the of the panel. It's going to be uh, we have uh, four speakers. It's going to be between twelve and fifteen minutes uh, per speaker. Then they can reply to each other, maybe if they have some comment to each other uh, for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and the rest of the time will be time open for uh, questions uh, from the audience. Mm -hmm. So the four speakers we have today, uh, uh, they are going to appear in this order. So first is uh, Doris uh, Oberta Bernick. She is uh, a postdoc uh, senior researcher at the WTI, the World Trade Institute. Uh, then uh, Patrick uh, Tomberger, he is uh, also a postdoc senior researcher at the World Trade Institute. The third one will be Joe Franquez, he is a managing director and professor of economics at the World Trade Institute and the University of Bern. And the fourth speaker will be Clara Brandi. She is a postdoc research, uh, senior researcher at the German Development uh, Institute. So um, I have a, a, to make a point, so questions uh, should be written in the questions uh, and answer uh, panel and uh, they should be maybe in brackets you can add to whom you are uh, uh, asking a question if it is uh, for somebody. If you are uh, using social media, please uh, uh, add the uh, hashtag uh, World Trade Forum 2020. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, with that we can we can start uh, uh, with the first uh, panelist, the first uh, speaker. So Doris, maybe you want to share your uh, material. And unmute yourself. Good. So can everybody see my screen? Okay. Great. So, um, good day. Thank you very much for being here and also thank you for inviting me and thanks Octavio for introducing me. So in uh, the short talk I'm going to talk about today, I will focus on greenhouse gas emission footprints and also focus on the role of international trade and how trade impacts on these footprints. So uh, as we already know for several decades, uh, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emission in order to slow down global warming. However, CO2 emissions have been increasing by about 63% uh, between 1990 and 2018. And they are keeping increasing, so they have not yet peaked. So this indicates that existing environmental relation, uh, regulation has not been effective. So there were uh, several international environmental agreements. The first one with binding emission constraints was the Kyoto Protocol, however, uh, only uh, certain countries, especially developed countries, had these binding emission constraints. So this provided room for emission leakage and also um, compliance and enforcement with the emission targets was problematic. So the Paris Agreement takes a slightly different approach because it puts emission reduction targets on all uh, parties to the agreement. However, these emission reduction targets are specified by the national governments of the parties to the protocol. So these nationally determined contribution which specify the emission targets are very heterogeneous. So they focus on different sectors, different gases, take different time horizons on when the targets should be, um, should be achieved and um, that provides a lot of heterogeneity. And this type of heterogeneity has been um, a hindrance of reaching an agreement in international negotiations on cooperation mechanisms as the ones foreseen in the Paris Agreement, such as implementing global markets for carbon. This led several countries or groups of countries to pursue unilateral climate action. However, such climate action is not very popular because domestic firms are worried about their competitiveness because they might lose market share to foreign uh, companies which are not constrained in terms of emissions. Workers might fear that they get unemployed and so on. And also if the production is shifted to foreign countries which are less environmentally efficient, this might even be counterproductive from an environmental point of view. So the question that we should answer is how to speed up the implementation of uh, climate policy. And as I will argue, uh, it is very important to take into account international trade and its impact on emissions. 
So in this short talk, I will focus on the two main important greenhouse gases, which are uh, CO2 emissions and methane emissions. And as you can see in this table, CO2 emissions have been increasing from 97 to 2014. Once we focus on methane emissions, which you can see on this second column of the table, they have been equivalent to about a third of CO2 emissions if they are evaluated um, as CO2 equivalents in terms of the global warming potential over 100 years. And they also have kept increasing, however, less so than CO2 emissions. So if instead of taking a focus on the next 100 years, we focus on the nearer term and evaluate the CO2 equivalents of methane emissions, um, in terms of global warming potentials over 20 years. As you can see in the third columns, methane emissions have been about equivalent to CO2 emissions. And this comes from their, um, from their particularities that they, are, they have a much uh, shorter atmospheric lifetime than CO2 emissions with a much larger global warming potential concentrated at the beginning of it, its atmospheric life. So methane emissions are very relevant for controlling climate change in the near term. They also have uh, strong and mostly coincidence effects on global temperatures. So it's very important to also focus on methane abatement. However, in international climate uh, negotiations or climate agreements, they are usually bundled together with other greenhouse gases so to CO2 equivalents. So what we have done at the World Trade Institute is we have worked on um, different emission footprints for different greenhouse gases, among other CO2 and methane emissions. So in what follows, I will focus on the two greenhouse gases separately. So this um, map shows the um, production-based footprint of CO2 emissions on a per capita basis. And is, as you can see, high-income countries um, have a very large CO2 emission footprint per capita, such as Canada, the US, Norway, Australia. So what we asked ourselves is what um, happens if instead of taking a consumption, a production-based perspective, we focus on a consumption-based perspective. So we traced emissions that are released in production processes through global supply chains and assigned them to the country in which the final product is consumed. And once we look at what happens to footprints, the patterns changes slightly and high income countries usually have a larger consumption based footprint than a production based footprint, pointing towards um, the import of CO2 embodied in products. We can see this more clearly in, the, in this slide here, where on the right hand side we have a graph for Annex 1 countries that ratified the Kyoto Protocol. So these are countries with binding emission constraints um, specified in the Kyoto Protocol. And in the left-hand graph, we have uh, the counterpart of non-Annex 1 countries. So emissions per capita from production, which you can see here as the dots, have been on average larger in Annex 1 countries than in non-Annex 1 countries. If we focus on consumption-based footprints, which are the orange dots here, you can also see that in most Annex 1 countries, consumption-based emission footprints are larger than production-based emission footprints. So this points towards them being um, net importers of CO2 emissions, whereas the pattern is not clear for non-Annex 1 countries, like seen in the first graph. So what happens if we look at methane emissions? As you can see in this graph, the distribution of the responsibility for emissions on a per capita basis is somehow different to what we saw for CO2 emissions. Because here, uh, since methane emissions are concentrating in specific economic sectors, so not only uh, fossil fuel intensive sectors, but also waste management and especially also agricultural sectors, such as cattle farming or rice production, middle income countries are also um, relevant in terms of their methane emission footprints, as you can see here for Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Russia, and so on. So what happens if we take a consumption-based perspective and trace these emissions again through global value chains is that high-income countries become much more important in terms of their methane footprint, because they are again net importers of methane as well. So if we focus on this dot chart, which is similar to before, but now for methane, we see that for Annex 1 countries, the consumption-based footprint is usually quite much larger than the production-based footprint. Whereas for non-Annex 1 countries, uh, it's not true to the same extent. 
So if we put numbers on that, we can see here that OECD countries, for example, um, produce on average 10.2 tons of CO2 emissions per capita, but they consume 11.1 tons of CO2 per capita. So this means that net importation accounted for about 9% as compared to production-based emissions. If we focus on, uh, on individual countries such as Switzerland, for example, we see that this difference can be very large. So here, consumption-based emissions are more than double the production-based emission footprints. So net importations amounted to about 131% of production of CO2 emissions. If we focus on non-OECD countries, we see uh, an opposite pattern because here production-based emissions outweigh consumption-based emissions, meaning that non-OECD countries on average are net exporters of emissions. So for our methane emissions, it's a similar pattern. So here also for high income countries, usually consumption based emissions outweigh production based emissions, meaning that high income countries are usually net importers of methane emissions as well. And if you focus on the last column here, you can see that the net importation are very large share as compared to production based emissions. So the difference between production-based emission footprints and consumption-based emission footprints are very uh, important because they are usually quite large. And that's why it's really important to take into account um, embodied emissions or emissions embodied in international trade. So if we move on to more um, structural analysis, in which we try to identify causal impacts of different variables on emission footprints, we can see the following. So we can uh, see that income growth or higher income per capita usually leads to an increase in emissions, which is indicated by these positive coefficients here. What we can see is that these patterns also holds for countries at higher income levels. So this means that the scale effect of economic growth will lead to an increase in emissions um, also in countries at a higher level of economic development. So there's nothing such as an environmental Kuznets curve which states that at higher levels of development economic growth leads to a reduction of emissions. This is not found for global pollutants such as CO2. If you focus on the second column here, you can see um, the effects um, when looking at consumption-based footprints. And here the income elasticity is even larger, meaning that income is connected to even dirtier consumption patterns as compared to production, which reflects also what you saw in the previous slides that consumption-based emissions usually outweigh production-based emissions in high-income countries. So for CO2 uh, emissions, that was the patterns for CH4 emissions or methane emissions, the pattern looks quite similar. However, the income elasticities are smaller in amount as compared to CO2 emissions. So we also try to evaluate binding emission constraints in the Kyoto Protocol and whether they were able to reduce emission footprints. And if they did, you would expect to find a negative impact here, meaning that binding emission constraints lead to a reduction in emissions. However, as you can see, this is not the case. So binding emission constraints in the Kyoto Protocol have not significantly led to a reduction in CO2 emissions, also not for methane emissions. And for consumption-based methane footprints, we see that they were even larger in Annex 1 countries as compared to non-Annex 1 countries. So this points to uh, the fact that there might have been um, emission intensive imports in Annex 1 countries and there might have been something like emission leakage. So what these results suggest is that economic growth um, will lead to an increase in emissions if we do not implement um, effective policies in order to reduce emissions. So this means that climate action is especially urgent. Also, the uh, binding emission constraints to subgroup of countries, such as those specified in the Kyoto Protocol, have not been very effective because they allowed for emission leakage. So these are challenges for international environmental agreements and especially for agreements that should cover all countries. But since uh, the Paris Agreement left it to national governments to specify their contributions, this led to this heterogeneity in emission targets. 
and this made it complicated to reach conclusions on international carbon markets. So one of the stumbling bo uh, blocks for the climate summit last year in Madrid was, among others, also the specific treatment of methane emissions because these are grouped together to CO2 uh, equivalents to CO2 baskets that should be made tradable on global markets. However, countries with, with large uh, livestock sectors such as uh, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay were especially concerned about the specific treatment of methane emissions. So in order to um, speed up negotiations and to reduce uncertainties um, connected to the conversions of different uh, greenhouse gases to CO2 equivalents, it could be promising to focus on separate agreements for different greenhouse gases. Also, since methane emissions are concentrated in specific economic sectors, it might make sense to uh, talk about sectoral agreements for methane emissions because this would reduce the number of parties that are um, involved in these negotiations because a small number of countries account for a very large share of methane emissions in specific sectors. So when it comes to climate action by subgroup of countries, it's important to take into account also this um, potential emission leakage, meaning that an uh, economic activity can um, move to countries that are unconstrained in terms of emissions. So emissions embodied in trade have to be addressed in order to uh, allow countries to implement unilateral climate action and put the price on emissions. And this, um, Emissions embodied in international trade could be addressed, for example, by focusing on consumption-based um, pricing of emissions, which would mean that um, the product is priced independently on, or the carbon content of a product is priced independently on where the carbon emissions emerge, whether they are from domestic producers or from foreign producers. However, at least in the European Union, it seems that uh, the way goes much more towards border tax adjustment, which would level the playing field for firms and also address emissions embodied in trade. Because the European Union plans a uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism that should be implemented. So the, the questions to be answered there are uh, how to design such potential border tax adjustment, how to treat, for example, uh, the issue of um, an emission trading system where the price fluctuates. How should uh, the emission content of imports be evaluated? So there are specific design issues that need to be taken into account in order to make border tax adjustment um, compatible with WTO law. And that's where um, negotiations should go. So thank you very much for your attention. And I will stop sharing the screen. So I will be happy for any kinds of questions or discussions afterwards. Thank you. So, Patrick, I think uh, you can. Okay, um, many thanks, Octavio. Then I will try to <clears throat> share my screen. If I did everything correct, you should see my slides now. You should be able to hear me. And then I want to thank Doris for her interesting presentations. And also many thanks to the organizers of the World Trade Forum who let me speak here today about the structural decomposition analysis of the EU's energy footprints. Specifically, we will take a more closer look to the efficiency policy framework of the EU now, also with this uh, focus on territorial production versus its effects on its energy footprints. Um, why do I want to speak about energy in this panel? Um, first and for all, because in one way or the other, um, energy is the fuel that keeps the global economy running. Um, mainly driven, of course, by increasing economic development in key developing countries like China and India, but also increasingly the rest of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East as well. Um, because of this, you can see here in the first column of this table, um, global energy usage is increasing over time, um, giving here a million tons of oil equivalents and as primary energy consumption. And because of the demand of these countries, this is going to be the case also for the future, according to IEA estimates. Um, what you probably also can infer from this table is that um, here in column two, the share of fossil fuels is stubbornly high in the years we look at, 
And if there is no dramatic change in policies, this is going to stay as well, despite we can also observe some strong increases in the usage of new renewable energy sources like wind and solar energy. Essentially, this leaves us with two consequences. The first is since fossil fuels are typically located in very specific geographic regions, we, see, we will see increasing competition for uh, those concentrated resources. But more importantly here, um, the usage of fossil fuels is associated to global greenhouse gas emissions because using them reduces CO2, which we just heard is the most important uh, of those greenhouse gases. On the flip side, however, this means that a well-designed energy policy can contribute a lot to the abatement of greenhouse gas emissions. And especially attractive for policymakers is looking at reducing energy intensity, meaning the amount of energy that is used in order to produce a given amount of output. The IEA estimates that if we want to halve our emissions until 2050, um, about 31% of those required emission reductions can come from decreasing energy intensity. There is also some literature which claims that there's a positive correlation between economic growth and efficiency. And our focus here will be especially um, efficiency policies in the European Union. First of all, because it's a large user of primary energy. Um, it has been the second largest energy users behind the United States in 97 and it's still the la third largest one in 2014 after the United States and China. And second, the European Union has um, complemented the climate target to its energy policy for quite some time now, um, mainly because of the reasons we discussed now. It now claims to follow an efficiency first principle, uh, simply because the cleanest, cleanest energy available is of course the one not used, and the energy not used, of course, has also not to be imported. So um, uh, what the EU has done in a series of directives, uh, the first since 2006, it has set energy efficiency targets for its member states. The first one, the 2006-32 directive, required the member states to reduce energy by 9% due to efficiency improving measures. And those targets have been complemented by targets on the share of renewable energy sources and greenhouse gas emissions and tightened in following directives this 2012-27 and in 2018 where the efficiency target has been increased to 32.5% until 2013. The main energy in, uh, instruments the EU wants to implement its uh, conduct its efficiency policy is energy audits for large firms energy savings from energy distributors and nationally implemented plans provided by the member states. So the focus here are clearly large firms. Good, um, but as any energy policy, also energy efficiency policies around the world, the EU has a focus on territorial production though, meaning they look at or target energy intensity defined as physical energy usage by the domestic industries, in order to produce relative to national value added or GDP, meaning um, that policy makers address and observe only the efficiency of the production process within their territory. What they do not do is to look how efficient their economy is with respect to the final goods they assemble within their territory, since they use uh, imported intermediates, and how efficient the production is with respect to the uh, final goods we consume within the territory. As we have uh, heard just before, if those policies are just target territorial production, this may change relative prices probably, leading that to firms to outsource, especially the energy intensive production to other less restricted territories. Good, so the main question we want to answer uh, in this work, which we conducted under WTI here recently, is um, whether the EU is on track with its energy, energy efficiency first principle. Meaning, uh, is it likely that the EU reaches its efficiency targets according to territorial production? Um, can we find evidence that the EU's efficiency policy plays some role in that development? And most importantly, do the gain, it's, uh, if we find gains in energy efficiency, do they extend to final production or final consumption? 
what we then might do with these results to discuss it in this panel is um, what challenges are there in implementing eff uh, effective efficiency policies? Um, do we need new policies or adapt the existing ones? And are there differences or similarities to the measures required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? So in order to answer at least the first part of the questions, what we do here is we um, conduct a structural decomposition analysis of the overall energy usage and energy efficiency within the European Union. We apply this on a detailed data set on territorial pro energy production in the EU, as well as energy footprints for final production and final consumption. Um, this data is quite detailed. We have 57 sectors and their connections along global value chains um, between those sectors in those regions for 78 regions. And we cover the time period from 97 to 2014. And we have six energy commodities in there. Specifically, what we apply is um, index decomposition method, the logarithmic mean division index method, which is essentially a uh, generalization of the Montgomery Warshire price index. So in case you're not so familiar with what um, index decomposition does is, we obtain from it six indices, which allows us to decompose the relative changes in the total energy usage of a specific region, or it changes in its economy-wide energy efficiency according to changes in these, those six factors. Specifically, we look at how energy usage and efficiency in the EU, for example, changes if sector energy intensity changes. So how much energy use uh, the sectors involved in the production of all the goods we produce or consume uh, per unit of output changes. We look at how they change the energy mix, whether the changes in the bundle of intermediates used along global and local supply chains has an effect on overall energy usage and efficiency, as well as the sector composition of final goods produced and traded, the geographical composition of final good trading partners, and the volume of final goods produced, assembled, or consumed as a proxy for economic growth. Um, having done this, I moved the slide too far. We can jump directly to the results, which for um, changes in total energy usage for the European Union, to other high income regions, the United States and Japan, other high income regions grouped to the rest of OECD aggregate, after separated because those countries often have a strong policy link to the European Union and for comparison reason China as a developing economy. What you see here on the y-axis is first on these black dots the uh, change in total energy usage in percent uh, for these regions between 1997 and 2014. Um, the colored stacked bars are the contributions of these six uh, factors which I described before. They are colored according to the legend here. And yeah, um, how they affected the overall change in energy usage. And I think the most important message to take with us is that many factors do not contribute at all to energy changes. What's mainly important is economic activity here in gray increasing energy usage in all the regions. And most importantly, what typically acts as a counterforce is reductions in sector energy intensity here in this dark gray. Here for most of the regions, especially in the European Union, uh, some other high income regions and China. And I forgot to mention it, we have this data for all three inventories in our data set. Um, also important is um, the third factor that uh, affects overall energy usage are changes in supply chains. Um, but it depends upon the region um, whether these changes contribute positively or negatively to energy usage. And I want to depart here with noting that sector energy intensity can be important to reduce overall energy usage. So it makes sense to have policies focusing on that. If we look at the EU, what's also interesting is um, changes in supply chains and energy se sector energy intensity contributed to reducing overall energy usage, but in territorial production only 
Um, this was not the case in the footprints. So energy usage in the footprints increased over that time. Having these results obtained, we might want to look at the determinants of the EU's overall energy efficiency, where in this plot you can see the same information as before, but the percentage changes do not refer to the percentage change in energy usage, but to the percentage change in energy efficiency. And what we see here is that in, for energy efficiency, it's mainly again sector energy intensity that drives overall efficiency and supply chains. Most of the other factors are not so important, probably except a bit the production structure, the sectoral production structure uh, of final goods produced. Um, if we look at the EU, um, we see that overall energy efficiency increased, sorry, quite considerably, again, between 97 and 2014. And it was mainly driven by improvements in sector energy intensity. Again, we have also strong intensity improvements for the footprints, but um, they were not strong enough to outweigh changes in supply chains in this case. So we have only very low improvements in energy efficiency in the footprints. We see this pattern is qualitatively similar in the other high income regions, OECD and EFTA, more or less qualitatively. And another pattern we observe for the United States and Japan. So this could point that the efficiency legislative in the European was somehow um, contributing to these gains, which we observe here. But to look closer at this, we split our sample now into two periods, one from 97 to 2007, and one for the years thereafter, because the first efficiency uh, directive was implemented in 2006. So if effective, we should see that something is going on in the pattern of energy intensity of the European Union in the second period, which was not there in the first period. So this is what we do on this slide. Here we have the first subsample, the same information for the bars and the uh, groups as before. And here, sorry, I jumped too much, for the second period. And the interesting finding is that in the first period, um, decreases in sector energy intensity were on average 1.1% for the European Union. And this increased to 3% in the second period. Um, we also observe, though it's not on the slide here, but I have in the appendix if you're interested, is that in the second period, more of the individual EU members show decreases in sector intensity in period two compared to period one, which sounds all very promising. What uh, makes us a bit skeptical is that also when we look at the individual members, this res the overall result seems to be largely driven by large Western European countries, specifically France, Great Britain, Italy, and Spain, who had worsening energy intensities in the first period, but switched to improving ones in the second. And since we see a similar pattern for other high income economies, specifically United States and Japan, it could be that the EU just follows a common trend among high income countries or big high income countries in that case. So, Thus, in order to get some light into this issue, we have to put our analysis on a further detailed level, which we do on this cater plot here, where we see for all the individual countries in our data set, for both periods on the y-axis, the average percentage change in energy intensity. For different groups, the yellowish ones here are the BRICS countries, except South Africa. Uh, green are Eastern European members, bluish is Western European EU15 members, um, red are the other OECD members, and black are all the remaining countries in our data set. Um, light shaded colors indicate that the data is for period one, so average changes of energy intensity in period one. And the darker colors indicate that this same data is for period two, and on the y, uh, x axis, sorry, we have the absolute level of economy-wide energy efficiency for those members always measured at the beginning of each of the two periods. 
So, and what we are interesting or what we want to see actually is that there is some pattern for the U members going on with respect to energy intensity between the first and the second period, which we cannot observe for the other groups. And if we look here for the EO15, it seems to be that they have in the second period, they shift downwards on the y-axis, meaning they have higher energy intensity reductions in the second period compared to the third, first, sorry. And strikingly, we do not observe this for the new Eastern and Central European members, which seem to shift upwards when going from the first to the second periods. If we look at the OECD countries, we see a pattern somewhat like the EU15 countries, but not so clear, I would argue. So just from a visual assessment, we could say that of all the groups, only the EU15 shows stronger reductions in energy intensities compared to period one, when we move to the second period, which could point to the effectiveness of the EU's energy efficiency in legislative framework. What we do on the last slide here now is to see if we can get some statistical foundation for the visual assessment. And for this, we regress our average changes in the energy intensity factor for both periods on the efficiency level in the beginning of both periods, income per capita, an indicator for the second period. We have indicators for being EU member and an interaction for EU in the second period, and the same similar in uh, indicators and interactions for the OECD countries. And what stays in this first regression table stands out is that we see that in the second period, EU and OECD seem to have stronger reductions in energy intensity than the base group. However, this is not significant. And at least for the EU, this could be because of the opposing patterns we visually have um, seen for the Western and Eastern EU members, such that we do a second regression where we split the EU dummy and the interaction up to a separate one for the EU15 and the Eastern European countries. And here we now see that in the second period, um, the EU15 have considerably higher energy intensity, significantly higher energy intensity reductions than in the base group. Um, which was not there, however, in the first period, and we do not find a similar pattern for the other groups in there. Meaning um, that this points a little bit that the efficiency legislation behind the EU, uh, which is conducted by the European Union, could be effective, but for the rich Western European countries or more economically advanced Western European countries only. With that, I think I'm over the time already. And I have now accidentally stopped my screen, sharing my screen, which I'm very sorry about. But I'm almost finished anyway. Um, so we do find some evidence for efficiency gains um, driven by reduction in sector energy intensity, but for the EU15 only. Um, what leaves us here is that it's still questionable um, that those gains are large enough to reach the EU efficiency targets until 2013 because literature suggests that intensity improvements have decreased in the recent years again. And we stay here with noticing that efficiency improvements do not extend to the energy footprints. And with that, I think I want to give back to the panel and thank you very much and apologizing to Octavio for taking too much time. Okay, so. Let me figure out the screen sharing myself here. Is that okay? All right, good. Um, so again, um, thank you those of um, those of you that are patiently listening to us go through this and. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and uh, look at sort of how we assess policy moving forward. All right. And that means um, in this case, I'm going to take the, the EFTA and the EU trade agreements with Mercosur and go through a bit on those. 
in terms of using the tools that you've just seen us walking through, uh, MRI analysis and such, and what that may tell us about the um, sustainability impacts of the agreements. Um, and a few lessons to pick up as we go along, so I'm going to grab some pictures. Um, and then I'll return to these talking points at the end. So one, for example, from what Doris was saying before, um, you know, the G, you know, GVCs matter. And if you think about what happens if a policy changes activity in a region, it ends up depending on how that sector in that region is linked to other regions. Okay, um, basic point, but it turns out it can matter, matter a bit. Um, and so these third country effects uh, have, they have effects that may be substantial. Um, it also means that when we try to identify priority sectors, so for example, if you look at the scoping work that's done, say in Brussels when they're doing an agreement and they're trying to see which sectors may be problematic and which ones they want to do flanking measures on, um, if we ignore these linkages, we may miss things. Um, and so I'll just illustrate that, that as well. And then just some musings that then follow on kind of what we've heard with Doris talking about the um, taxing on consumption, which is we need to think about which taxes are covered by PTAs and which ones not if we start introducing new ones that are meant to address some of the, the concerns that are covered in this session. Okay, so this first picture here is then um, looking at uh, linkages between Switzerland and the Mercosur economies and two different views basically. And actually I noticed that the, the right one only has two greenhouse gases and the left one has four, sorry about that. Um, but the point being that on the left, um, in terms of Swiss purchases of products at an activity level that then, you know, are generating emissions, you know, which act, you know, which sectors in terms of activity are these in, right? Um, and, you know, you see the usual suspects, for example, uh, one of the big ones on um, uh, is cattle, okay? But also petrochemical production and things like that. The right-hand side then is then going through this, you know, you know cranking through the IO tables and identifying, you know, how those are then crammed into the products that are actually shipped across the ocean to Switzerland. Okay, right, so on the one hand, you've got activities that are across a number of sectors that are supporting trade uh, for exports to Switzerland. But it turns out that that stuff ends up, you know, going through supply chains and moving downstream in just a few sectors, right? And the first one there is meat, which again is not surprising. And politically, the debate in Switzerland focused on that. Okay, that, pro that you know, processing meats depend on cattle, depend on transport, depend on a bunch of other stuff to get them to the Swiss border. Um, the other one is in metals. Okay, those two account for the lion's share of um, you know, traded goods in terms of the emissions that are embodied in them, as opposed to the activities that are going on to support the trade in Switzerland. So two different, you know, in a sense, if you're trying to identify sectors that you're worried about in terms of environmental impacts, it means there's a few where if you open those up quite a bit, then um, you're gonna get impact. Now, it turns out that in the Swiss case for meat, um, the agreement just keeps the existing TRQs in place. So for about half of the emissions, there's gonna be no change in trade, okay? In terms of the backward linkages and stuff. Um, here's then looking at, and there's various versions of this kind of picture. Also, if you look at the, the EC scoping study on their own agreement, where, um, you know, which, how important are different sectors in terms of total output? I'm sorry, sorry, in terms of total emissions. Or embodied resources, right? This could be lumber, this could be water, um, could be child labor, whatever, right? But whatever the thing is you're concerned about, how important in terms of the, the totals overall is a given sector. And then um, what happens to those sectors in terms of output changes from the agreement? In here, what you can see is, you know, while um, meat production of cattle and, and sheep and goats and stuff is a primary source of emissions, again, because of the quotas, there's very little that happens. Okay, so you can get a sense of when we're gonna see impact and when not. And we'll contrast this with the EU agreement in a minute, um, but not quite yet. So 
Another thing then is if you look at these globally, and this comes out of a, um, you know, running a full blown global numerical model, having these, uh, the, the value chains inside there based on the numerator tables. And one thing to notice, if we look at Microsoft, where we get an increase uh, either by use or by activity, I'll explain that in a minute. So use is here is given output um, you know, in following all the upstream sources of emissions, right? What, what happens um, in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, what's generated by the vector of final output. And source is then the traditional one that's geographically based. But by either one, if you, to if you focus on the total in metric tons, compare Microsoft and rest of the world, right? So there, if you look at the, the estimated change, about half of it, actually a bit more than half, is offset by changes in production patterns in third countries. Okay. And that follows not just from, you know, trade displacing stuff, but the fact that you've got linkages in terms of which sectors are doing what. And um, yeah, this is important, right? So what this tells us is that if we don't look at third country effects, if we don't kind of treat the same thing holistically, then moving forward as we look at trade agreements, if we don't think about the third country effects, we may miss stuff, right? One example would be suppose that, as is the case in this agreement, Switzerland gets better access for machinery to Latin America. They displace Chinese machinery that, produce, that uses steel produced with coal that's not as clean as the Swiss energy grid, right? And so those Chinese effects matter as well. And so anyway, it turns out that the third country effects show up when you start running simulations and thinking about changes in policy moving forward. Um, here then I'm gonna shift um, towards looking at, and this is sort of stuff ongoing, please note the disclaimers and stuff at the bottom. Um, maybe these numbers don't exist, et cetera. But uh, you know, looking first, let's take Argentina. And here I've got four, and this is you know, CO2 metric ton equivalents across four greenhouse gases. Um, but you know, shares based on direct activity. So this is given what's happening in the country. But then the second set of numbers is shares um, count, accounting for linkages. The fact that you may be buying petrochemicals from somewhere else and that feeds in. And so you know, trying try to account for the, the cross-border linkages. And sectors become much more or less important once you take that into account. Okay, so for example, an extreme one is mining or extraction, where there's lots of big equipment and energy and stuff that's bought outside the country and brought in to support the sector. And once you account for that, that sector is, you know, instead of, you know, 3%, it ends up being over 12% of the share of emissions from the economy. Um, at the same time then, because of that displacement of shares, it's still important, right? The cattle sector still matters. But instead of about a third, it's about a fifth of the overall emissions. So again, the, the kinds of things that, that you know, we're talking about in terms of taking account of cross-border linkages, um, it shows up in terms of identifying which sectors stand out. And then also if we try to think of, you know, if the scoping where um, when agreements are first set up, and we heard, by the way, in the, the opening session this morning with the discussion on non-trade policy objectives and trade agreements, this is certainly one of those, right? And part of that process involves identifying sectors where you might wanna have flanking agreements or you might wanna think about technology transfer or other kinds of, of, of policy measures. And you, know, you, may identify, you may misidentify which sectors matter, right? So here in this case, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, the mining sector really sticks out as an example, but you can imagine others in other contexts. Um, also, in contrast to the, uh, the, the EFTA agreement, the EU agreement does provide expanded market access for beef. Okay. And so if you're following the, um, the public policy debate on this and interest by various member states, um, part of it reflects this reality. Okay, so the beef sector, first off, and, and this again is Argentina, it's, it, it's, um, it's methane. But you know, the beef sector is about seventy percent of, of of total emissions in that sector. This is this is accounting for actual activity and not the upstream linkages. You can that's the other thing with you know, as Doris was laying out that we have 
traditional um, sort of geographically based measures. We have final output measures and we have final consumption measures now. So you could actually split this into three different views and they'll give you different numbers. But the point still is that that sector stands out. And in this case, the sector expands. Yeah. So that has implications in terms of possible deforestation, it has implications in terms of um, methane profiles and such. So, you know, here we've got the same sector, what ha happens inside the agreement has implications for what happens in terms of uh, the sustainability measures. And the two agreements do things differently. And not surprisingly, then we get different results from that. So coming back to the talking points, and I'll, I'll, well, I'll wrap this up to uh, give some of my time. Remember, uh, backward, backwards, Patrick, you're getting some of my time. So, <laughs> um, so first off, you know, you're looking at the, the EFTA Mercosur agreement in the example there, third country effects can be substantial. Okay, so if we're trying to examine policy between sets of countries, we need to think about the other countries involved. Um, again, because GVCs mean this stuff is connect, interconnected in ways that we kill, it really can't work through analytically. We have to run the numbers. That's how we figure it out. Um, related to that, then, is if you're trying to identify which sectors to worry about, you also need to bring this stuff online, on board. If you don't, you're likely to mislead yourself in terms of, you know, saying, well, these sectors don't look that important here, where it turns out they do, or vice versa. Um, so again, for, you know, in terms of scoping and stuff, and not just MRIO, but this work on life cycle uh, you know, aspects of the products, I think that's also important to sort of bring that in to get a sense of um, you know, wh which measures and which sectors one might want to move to. And you've already heard this mentioned once, uh, actually a couple of times, I guess, in terms of carbon taxes. But if we think about different border measures, I think we also need to think about which ones get to be included in future agreements and which ones not. Right. I mean, if you treat it as VAT, for example, then it's not negotiated away um, as part of a trade agreement. But if you're not careful, you may end up removing incentives, depending on how the programs are set up. If you put border adjustments on the table as part of what's negotiated inside the agreement. Um, and I think I'll stop with that. That was about 11 or 12 minutes. And um, turn it back to Octavio. So. Let me, let me sh figure out if I can unshare the screen. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Success. I think Clara is uh, now, okay. I you think Clara it. might be muted, right? You are muted. Many things. It's it's a great pleasure to be here on this panel, and I thank all my previous speakers um, for providing very in, interesting insights. Um, Joe and also the other previous speakers have already alluded to potential ways to make value chains more sustainable or the global economy more, more sustainable, focusing mostly on state actors and state actions. Um, I will move beyond state actions and also look at non-state actions and the private sector. I will focus on voluntary sustainability standards, which are a widely used instrument to govern different aspects of global value chains, environmental, social, ethical issues, and we've touched upon some of these already in, in this panel. So according to this ITC standards map, there are now over 270 different VSS operating in 600 product groups in 15 industries and 180 countries. So by now, uh, this means that these private sustainability standards apply to millions of farms, plantations, factories around the world. It is surprising though, that VSS have received rather little attention in the debate on the implementation of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the, the SDGs. While the United Nations have called upon the private sector to contribute more strongly to the achievement of the SDGs, VSS, the standards, have as of yet not played a prominent role in this debate. And against this background, our research focuses um, on VSS in the context of SDGs and intends to inform the debate on the potential and the limitations of 
of BSS in this area and in um, making supply chains more sustainable. And what I'm presenting today is joint work together with um, several researchers in a, a number of different institutions, including Matteo Fiorini from the European University Institute, Philipp Schleifer from the uh, University of Amsterdam, and also colleagues from ITC and UNFSS. So our key question is, what is the potential of VSS to make value chains more sustainable and promote the achievement of the SDGs? So a, a bit of re um, background on our data and our methodology. So we use um, data from the ITC standards map, which is the most comprehensive resource on VSS and um, includes uh, more than, oh, this is 200 standards with 800 different requirements. What we did is we mapped all the overlaps between these 800 requirements, representing the more than 200 standards, with all the SDG targets that are out there in order to um, understand the connections between the world of VSS and the world of the SDGs. We distinguished these connections in terms of how precise they were defined and also how closely they correspond, so how closely the, the links are defined. We create what we call a linkage indicator. So everything else being equal, the lin linkage between a VSS system and an SDG target will be higher if the VSS covers more requirements that are relevant to that SDG target. So this means um, that the linkage indicator will be zero if the VSS does not cover any of those requirements and that the SDG linkage indicator will be highest if the VSS covers all the requirements that are linked to the SDG target, all the possible requirements in the database. Um, we look at this indicator at the global level, but also at the sector level and at the level of different um, countries. So we know looking at the linkages, what type of different VSS standards are active in which country and in which sector actually entail these VSS SDG linkages. So I'll um, provide you some sneak peek input, some sneak peek preview into um, some of our forthcoming results. Um, and I'll start by um, presenting a bird's eye perspective on the linkages between VSS and the SDGs by showing you um, the linkages at the SDG level across all 17 goals. So this is a simple bar chart of the 17 goals and the figure shows the number of VSS that include at least one requirement that overlaps with at least one target of each SDG respectively. Um, so um, it shows that there's a substantial variation across the SDGs, but that all SDGs except SDG 17 are covered by VSS. So this already gives you an impression that VSS can play a significant role in contributing um, to SDG implementation and making, yeah, making supply chains more sustainable in that, in that, in that manner. The number of VSS with SDG linkages is highest for goal eight, which refers to decent work and economic growth. Um, more than 800 different VSS, different standards. So almost the entire sample entail at least one requirement that overlaps with the content of SDG eight. There are also very um, frequent links for SDG 12, which links to responsible production and consumption. SDG two, which focuses on food security and the agriculture sector, but also SDGs 11, cities, SDG 6, water, SDG 3, health, 4, education, and 1, poverty. Um, so quite a few of the SDGs are covered by um, multiple VSS. To show you what we can uncover with our data, I will uh, dig a bit deeper and zoom into some findings for SDG 8. SDG 8 sets 10 targets to enhance economic performance and achieve higher levels of economic productivity. And you can see all the targets listed here on this slide. The figure shows that some targets of SDG 8 are covered by VSS while others are not. Specifically, the high number of linkages for the goal overall is mainly driven by target 8.4, resource efficiency in consumption and production, also by target 8.8, .8, labor rights and safe working environments. So the data reveals um, that at the target level, 230 VSS seek to promote resource efficiency, for example, by demanding environmental management instruments and working conditions as 
the conditions of actually um, complying with the standards. And so they entail potential to achieve these SDG targets. There are also a number of targets that are not covered by the BSS. Um, and this is mainly due to the nature of the targets of the SDG 8. It is no surprise, for example, that strengthening the capacity of domestic financial institutions, so target 8.10, is beyond the scope of BSS and cannot be, can hardly be achieved by, yeah, by private actors or in the context of these sustainability standards. Moving forward, um, I'll show you a map, and this map only includes standards, BSS, that have an active presence in a given country. The map shows the geographical distribution of voluntary standards. For SDG 8, it shows that the availability of BSS is highest in North America and in Europe, um, and also relatively high in South America and Asia. In contrast, there are relatively fewer BSS linked to SDG 8 active in parts of Africa and the Middle East. However, in the case of SDG 8, as we can see here, there are, there are a multitude of active BSS even in these less well-covered regions and countries. And this is the case uh, for most other SDGs. We also have this data available at the country level. So we know, for example, that in Indonesia, Southeast Asia's largest emerging economy, there are 90 standards linked to target 8.8 .8 labor rights and safe working environments. So we have very fine-grained data um, between SDG targets and VSS. In addition to the geographical variation, we can also look at the variation across industry sectors and product fields. And as this um, figure shows, by a significant margin, the number of BSS is highest in the agricultural sector. This is followed by textiles and garments and the consumer products and processed food sectors. Uh, within these sectors, um, there are also certain commodities that send out, for example, in the, in the agriculture se sector, there are 64 SDG 8 related BSS active in the soy sector. We can actually look at specific sectors and find out which BSS are active and relevant uh, for promoting SDGs and, and thereby making supply chains potentially more sustainable. So as in the case of countries in these sectors and product fields, policymakers and business leaders have a large number of BSS to choose from. Um, so some of the key takeaways are the world of private sustainability standards and the SDGs overlap to a significant degree. The um, SDG relevant VSS are widely available across countries and sectors, as we've seen. Um, and um, in many cases, there are more than 200 different standards linked to the targets of, of the specific SDG we're looking at. So this um, provides reason um, to think that VSS can contribute to the achievement of the SDGs by complementing the role of governments and international organizations. Some caveats, however, are in order. Uh, for example, uh, linkages that we look at only represent one relevant dimension in a complex debate on the effectiveness of VSS. And of course, market uptake will, will make, it, make a difference, for example. Secondly, um, numbers are not everything. The proliferation of VSS in certain sectors or countries can actually lead to adverse competition between these different programs. They can increase transaction costs or even be, become trade barriers for producers. So more is not always better. Um, and at the same time, last but not least, um, VSS can actually have unintended consequences, for example, for smallholders who often lack the organizational capacity and knowledge necessary to adopt and comply with sustainability standards. So these caveats have to be taken into account when looking at the potentials and the limits of sustainability standards to make supply chains more sustainable. At the same time, VSS schemes can also play a role for sustainability in ways that go beyond the requirements that we looked at in our analysis so far. Um, for example, by providing training and education programs, by raising consumer awareness, or even demanding and pushing for political change. So the, so the, so the effect in terms of making supply chains more sustainable can actually go beyond the requirements that are needed to to, um, uh, to be complied with in order to be certified by the standard. So we think that these um, insights provide um, some uh, inform interesting information for decision makers and enable, for example, to identify specific countries, and sectors in which specific BSS can give their potential to contribute to achieving the SDGs and making supply chains more sustainable and give some guidance to decision makers in different fields. Um, so this was just a first sneak peek preview and the report will be finalized in the coming days and be launched at the end of next week during the Geneva Trade Week. So 
if you want more information, then you look out for this report or join our um, session during the Geneva Trade Week. Um, yeah, and for now, let me thank you for your attention and I look forward to questions and comments. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for keeping the time <laughs> uh, to all of you. Uh, I think it's, uh, maybe you want to, to make comments to, to each other or maybe we can open already to the questions uh, uh, from the uh, attendees. Uh, I think we should, do, since we are not too many people, I think we should be flexible. And maybe the attendees uh, want to start uh, making some, some questions to the, to the uh, panelists. Uh, we should, uh, they should write the questions in the in the panel for that. Yo? Yeah, just a, a thought or an observation with the voluntary standards from the Swiss experience, which is that um, they can get captured. So we have a number of Austrian Thai people on the panel here. And Switzerland has a certain type of milk that's branded as having come from the mountains. Okay. Um, you know, alpine milk, cows that feed on grass and stuff. But um, the milk has to come from Switzerland. So kind of by definition, Austria does not have mountains and so cannot produce, you know, mountain grass fed milk. Um, that's clearly the capture of the, of the labeling. Um, also for some of the, the, the grocery store chains, they have their own private standards and those in some cases only apply to Swiss farms, only they can qualify. Um, it is the case that you can put on something, a label that says that you know, truthfully you qualify for some certain EU standard, but you don't get the, you know, the, the BO, you know, the Swiss BO label. Um, so there is some, you know, there's some regulatory capture even with the private standards. Feel free, Doris. Uh, wants to maybe Clara wants to 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 make some comment on Joe's. Uh. Well, mine is also related to the standards, but please, Clara, answer his his comment before, and then I will. No, then why don't you go ahead, and I will uh, take two questions at the same time. Okay, so thank you. It's a very interesting presentation. I really really like the topic. So um, I think I'm a little bit familiar with the IC, ITC standards map. And I was always a little bit concerned that it only measures the presence of a standard in a country, but not the take up of that standard by private actors. So I think in order to make the analysis even more meaningful and see whether the standards really can have an impact, it would be very important to measure how many private actors actually update these standards. So I was wondering whether you have some kind of information, whether that would be feasible or whether that's maybe planned to be implemented by the ITC as well, or maybe by your whole research group, or whether it's problematic because of some reasons. Thank you. Yes, many thanks. Two very interesting comments and questions, and I, I agree very much with the hands of both of them. Uh, so Joe, yes, capture is, is, uh, is a risk in this context, uh, I, I agree. Um, and it shows how important it is to how how these standards are designed, how they are governed, and um, who is uh, participating in their design process and in in, their, in 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 designing the governance mechanism behind them. Um, and this makes it even more worrying that in many um, standard organizations um, the representation is not always very um, broad or inclusive. Um, and often small producers, for example, or producers from certain countries are not as well represented as, as we would hope to make, yeah, to, to avoid perhaps um, these very out, uh, yeah, these very, um, these very, um, yeah, very uh, difficult problems of capture. But of course, um, this will always remain a challenge. But I think part participation and transparency about standard design can at least, um, um, play some role to to yeah to address this issue, and when it comes to um, market uptake, that's a very good comment, uh, and that's why I also mentioned it in my presentation as a potential caveat. Um, yes, we don't have any systematic data out there on market uptake, and of course, it's a very relevant dimension of effectiveness. Um, 
in many ways. Um, and we have been actually trying to collect as much data on market uptake as possible, and we're still in the process of doing so. So our hope is to complement in the future, complement our data now with a more systematic understanding of market uptake, but it's very difficult um, to get good, good reliable data on this. Um, there is some that is compiled um, uh, also with ITC involvement um, by Feeble, and they're also presenting some of the data in, in annual reports, so that's interesting. But there's much more scope out there for a systematic analysis and systematic data collection, and we're very much interested in um, in going further on this. So um, yes, you're very right, and that's definitely also in our um, interest. And it's very important because in many sectors, market uptake is not as high as it should be or could be, and it shows that the potential is limited in in many ways in, in that regard. But it's it's difficult to it's difficult to to um, to yeah to it's 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 important to take a detailed picture um, to take a de detailed look into this because of course it varies across sectors and countries very much. Yeah, so we've started compiling the data, but um, there will be more forthcoming hopefully. I just jump in again on that. So. Um, with national standards that are not, not, not private and voluntary, with national standards, in theory, um, you know, Switzerland, if the government introduces something that's discriminatory, right, they can be dragged to Geneva when the dispute mechanism is working, right? Not that it is now, but when it does work, um, it, it should be able to enforce that. I'm wondering if there isn't scope, I'm not a lawyer, but to maybe, you know, if you allow private standards that effectively become discriminatory. Could you use the same channel, right? Could you, should we think about maybe opening up the definition of measures that might be covered for non-discrimination and national treatment um, so that you can, you know, then you've got some kind of enforcement mechanism, right? You know that if you do it and it works and you block, you block competitors from abroad and it's not necessary for the goal of the measure, um, you know, then I would think that we could, you know, it might be something to put on the agenda of things that could actually be negotiated successfully. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I'm not only a lawyer, but it's food for thought for future <laughs> negotiators and lawyers for sure, yes. I don't see any, any comment in the, in the questions uh, uh, panel. Uh, Doris, do you have a... Well, I don't want to capture this discussion, but since there are no questions at the moment, I wanted to use the opportunity to ask a little question to Joe. Because I was wondering uh, about the slide that you showed for Argentina with the shares of greenhouse gas emissions by different sectors. And there, if you take into account the linkages, uh, the slide said that uh, financial services contribute to about 2.33%, whereas air transport only to 1.86%. So I was wondering why the financial services are indeed as pollutant and why that's the case as compared to air transport. Um, it's probably because they're using build, uh, capital buildings and stuff and the construction from that. So it's other things that feed into the, the, the profile of the sector. Um, but yeah, it, it's something to look at and poke through. Um, and I, yeah, I, I would have to go through the specific numbers. <laughs> but yeah, you know, these things raise questions, right? Um, you notice that some sectors are using more energy than others, or you don't notice the energy used directly, right? But then you notice it because they're buying buildings. Right, and stuff like that. But I don't know if that answers it. Patrick is waving his hand. I think um, we. Uh, sorry? Mm -hmm. um, could the financial thing be because they use ITC services, um, which are quite pollution intensive? Actually, yeah. So that's another one. Is that, yeah. So they're using things mm -hmm. that are energy intensive. Yep. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Again, we'd have to go through and look. Um, this is sort of, I, from crunching the numbers, we know what we got, but I don't know why. <laughs> I can see in the in the chat that uh, Brigitta Imeli, uh, we know her very well. Uh, she has uh, said something about uh, may I add something on the possibility to bring a claim on private standards. So, Joe, thank you for for bringing Brigitta. Maybe Brigitta wants to to talk. She's first. now a panelist. I was thinking about doing that. I was afraid that if we drafted her, she she'd be annoyed. But because she is a lawyer, okay. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, so Joe mentioned that uh, there might be a possibility to bring 
WTO claim, claims are uh, related to private standards. And uh, my view on this is uh, that uh, there are some instances where there is a possibility to do so. Uh, when uh, a private standard is related to the state because uh, it has been uh, the WTO inconsistent discriminating or otherwise trade restrictive overly trade restrictive behavior has been triggered by a state measure or has been endorsed by the state but uh, if the private activity is not uh, attributable to the state either by ways of uh, attribution or by way, way of uh, endorsement. My, my view is that Article 4.1 TBT agreement does not allow uh, to bring a claim. I'll just, I'll and uh, and uh, the Swiss case study uh, we made indicates that there are a certain circum, um, that there is a great number of private standards which are in fact related to state measures. For example, the, the law on uh, how you can, uh, on, under which circumstances you can name a product uh, as, a, as an alpine or a mountain product. Um, and uh, the way uh, uh, the retailers um, use their product labels. Um, also in cooperation with the Swiss organic farmers and uh, the, um, the um, non-organic farmer cooperative. Uh, and if, if the state is uh, uh, behind uh, these cooperatives and gives an incentive to the retailers to, um, to restrict trade, there might be a link to bring a claim. So um, this is my take on this. And I'll just, I'm going to add an obscure reference, which is actually from GATT Law, which is something called Kodak Fuji. If you guys are bored later and look it up. Back when we used to take pictures with physical film, and Japan made concessions to the US on tariffs for film, but there was a nullification and impairment argument that Japan tolerated a distribution cartel Right, which was private, but they didn't enforce rules against it operating as a cartel and that that basically undid the market access concessions. So I could imagine other ways you could argue that private standards, if they're tolerated by the regulation authorities, because I'm not a lawyer, um, but I, I could imagine that, that one could try to, to argue that it, un, it undoes market access concessions. Um, but, okay. And I'll stop now. Thank you, Brigitte, thank you. Much appreciated. So any further comment or question? If not, I will, I will ask Joe, uh, if I understood uh, correctly, you, you mentioned that uh, it may be uh, convenient to think of uh, how to introduce incentives or, or instruments in the end uh, in PTAs, if I understood correctly. Uh, my question is, uh, does not open uh, a room for, for uh, strategic behavior within uh, PTAs uh, in a more dangerous way than the, than the, the, the proper problem of uh, PTAs up to now in terms of strategies? I think we're, we're already full on in terms of strategic behavior. And again, if, if you guys go back and watch the, the session from this morning, um, one thing that's come out of this project that Bernard's been running, and, and look at, um, at Paolo's presentation in particular, um, looking at non-trade policy objectives in trade agreements. Um, the EU is more likely to push those on countries where they have, have leverage in, in negotiating. And it's clear that it's partly for strategic interests, uh, perhaps for industry, perhaps for things that are not fully just about uh, you know, the claim objective. You know, some, so for some countries, we care about labor, and other ones, we don't for example. Um, and so you know, that's, we're already in that land. Um, so I'm just thinking in terms of mechanism design, right? So if your intent is to effectively also promote some other objectives beyond trade, then you might want to think about how to do it. And you also want to think about which sectors to focus on. 
right? You might put measures in for technology transfer. You might think of some cooperative councils or something. You might want to focus on um, easier or earlier access for establishment where you have technology that might help achieve the objective, right? That's all I'm thinking. I, we're already in a case where lobbyists are all over the place. And, you know, and so there's a political dimension already to what goes into, into agreements and what doesn't. So we, we, we can empirically justify being cynical. And uh, for Clara, I will have another question. Do you have uh, any intuition why uh, goals 13 and 14 uh, are almost no covered by standards? Mm, yes, so in the context of 14, goal 14 covers oceans oceans fishing and there are actually many interesting and important fishing standards out there and you may know them from going to the supermarket and looking at the fish options um, but um, but in terms of absolute numbers there are not as many fish related standards than other standards so that means that in relative terms we just see fewer bss that are relevant for for fish and oceans but yes it's a very important it's a, a very important sectors uh, fish for VSS and so then this shows again that numbers are not everything and in the report we actually make clear that it's important to uh, yeah to take a differentiated look and and um, the fact that there are few standards doesn't mean that the sector is not well covered in, in a way and in the context of climate it's interesting because um, the SDG 13 uh, climate um, SDG is really formulated in a way that doesn't allow VSS, so non-state actors to play a larger role. Um, it's, it's really the formulation of the targets. So the fact that that um, SDG 13 climate is not as much covered doesn't mean again that VSS don't play an important role here. It's just that, in, um, it's just that the way the targets are formulated, um, the specific way they are defined, uh, makes it uh, makes make yeah makes make them a bit beyond the reach of the private sectors or non-state actors. It's more state actors that, for example, can help to mainstream climate change across all policies. That's nothing companies or VSS can do. That's something only state actors can do. And so it's a bit beyond the scope of VSS. Um, but of course, some uh, making GHG emissions transparent and um, uh, and um, re having requirements to reduce them in, in the supply chain. These are requirements that are, of course, relevant for SDG 13, and that's why we do have some linkages in that context. Yeah, I hope this helps to, helps to um, clarify the, the numbers. So this links uh, somehow, of course, to Dora's uh, presentation on, on her GHG emissions and where they're accounted for. And um, yeah, I was wondering how, how you actually, you mentioned border carbon adjustments, how you or see the potential for them in in reality i mean will they now uh, see the yeah will they actually be implemented by the eu for example and what are the potential repercussions perhaps also in this crisis now i mean i think of course covid19 has changed the discussion quite a bit um, in several directions it's relevant for this policy question as well So if I may uh, add something to what you discussed before for the standards of fish and so on, I think uh, harmonization of standards might play, play a role there, right? Because for fish, do you have, I think, if you go to the supermarket and look at the labels, a quite large uptake, but always of the same labels. So if there is harmonization, I don't know if, if you are able to, to look at uh, standards or types of standards where there is a larger harmonization already, and then take this into account in the analysis, or maybe you did it in the report already verbally to take that into account when you claim that the numbers are not the most important thing, but you have to be careful about that. Good point, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do that to some extent already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and to your question about border tax adjustment, I think um, it's a political option that is very much discussed. I think everything will depend on whether it's compatible with WTO law. And there are many different considerations that you have to take into account, especially in the European Union, you have an emission trading system where the price fluctuates. So it's not like a tax on carbon or on other greenhouse gases with a specific price. So the question is, how would you apply border tax adjustment in that context? And I think so far there is no uh, 
border tax adjustment in combination with emission trading. I think for California, there is a case where you have uh, that on energy with a border adjustment on energy where it works somehow, but only on a smaller scale. Um, also, it's I think it's relevant on how to make um, importers um, or products that are imported um, claim how, how high the carbon content is. So do you um, need that um, actually the products coming into the market need to be accompanied by a certificate or some kind of uh, confirmation of the carbon content? Do you take into account every step in the global value chain or only the last step before the product enters the border? Do you base it on the foreign carbon content or do you apply an average carbon content that would arise in the production of similar products at the national level and things like that? And especially if we take into account the whole value chain, I think it's um, really difficult to trace emissions at the product level. So especially if you put the uh, burden of proof how uh, emission intensive the production process is to the firms, that might be a big disadvantage for small firms, for example, because they might not have the means to, to implement this kind of um, measurements that would be necessary in order to put certificates um, to the products that they then export or that they sell on the markets. So I think it depends a lot on uh, these discussions and I think um, probably a lawyer would be much better <laughs> to evaluate which options are the relevant ones in order to reflect WTO law. But um, in a recent WTO report, um, it was mentioned that the WTO does not exclude the possibility of border tax adjustment. So it just needs to be um, in line with the WTO rules in order to make that possible. But I think it's a very relevant issue and I think there is indeed a future for border tax adjustment. If I can just jump in for a minute, so on the, on the border tax adjustment, um, it's, it's important to think about incentives and how it's done, right? So if you do, and we've talked about this in, in terms of piggybacking on VAT, for example, since those systems exist, right? Um, it's one thing when a product arrives at the border and you know what its status is, you know, or what its resource contents are. It's another when you only know that on average from China, it's, the, it's X, you know? And if you apply a tax in the first case, you send an incentive upstream, um, even from, you know, from firms who may wanna work with their suppliers upstream to reduce those, you know, the resource content so that they can then get the tax reduced. Whereas if there's a flat tax at the border that's average, the incentive is broken, right? Because it's just, there's a flat tax. And even if you get your upstream supplier to fix things, it doesn't matter, right? There's sort of a collective problem that you need to push down the national average. Um, and so I, that's why I was saying earlier, I think that, especially with, with, as we think about designing PPAs and stuff, is we have these measures in place at the same time, um, maybe we can't, you know, across the board do it everywhere, but then think about ways to move from a flat tax to things that are adjustable. So you can get incentives moving upstream, get your firms to work with upstream suppliers to try and bring down their, their resource profiles and such. Um, it's just, it, it's, you know, the, the microeconomics is very different depending on, and, and if what, what we want to do is in part, you know, transmit the incentives across borders, then we have to allow for that tax to adjust when individual firms adjust, you know, how they're doing things. But, and I'll shut up now. Um, if I may add to that as well. So I think if you have a flat tax, that would probably need to be based from a legal perspective, although I'm not an expert, on best available technology in order to not be discriminative for uh, firms uh, that have uh, a better emission standards, for example, than other firms. So I think there might be a, an incentive problem like the one that you mentioned before. I think also a problem is um, what do you do with uh, imports from countries that come from countries that have technical regulations in place or that have uh, efficiency standards in place? How would you rebate these kind of implicit pricing of emissions at the border where it's exported and how would you account that if the product is imported then into let's say the European Union which uh, which has a border tax adjustment or which thinks about having a border tax adjustment. 
So I think there are a lot of things that need to be clarified. Yeah. I'm going to comment on your comment on my comment. Just <laughs> so if you go, you know, all in and you know, piggyback on VAT and producers move certificates on with what their content is, and when it arrives at the border, you don't, you, know, you actually tax the actual content, right? Um, and then countries that have standards in place that then they're more efficient, and that's reflected when things arrive. Um, I think we just, you know, I understand that there's some burden of measurement and stuff, but, um, you know, it, it, again, this is partly about incentives, but it's partly, there may be a ways to then trans, that, that may be the kind of, of technology and stuff that we could transfer to get a system that worked. Um, and I'll, I'll stop commenting on comments on comments on comments. Well, I think we are we are reaching uh, uh, the time uh, to close. Nobody is uh, is uh, making questions uh, from the attendees, uh, so uh, I think they have the last minute option. We're now, afraid because we promoted Amelda. <laughs> we have uh, one for Patrick. Uh, can you read it, Patrick, from from the chat? Wait, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, he says something that, uh, does your work suggest that this might uh, not be the most efficient means uh, of lowering total energy use? Uh, you should uh, unmute yourself, Patrick. Uh, the microphone, Patrick. <laughs> but I now, okay, I push now the button three times, so I put it on, off, on, off. Uh, no, what I was saying is that uh, tackling sector energy intensity will uh, is probably not the, will be efficient. What we see is in bringing down uh, efficiency on a territorial based measure, but since it does not target your whole footprint, it does not really. Uh, bring your energy efficiency down with the footprints, right? So in order to do that, that, you would have to implement policies that also take uh, uh, energy usage embodied in imports and that, which is missing. So if you do it only for territorial production, meaning you reduce sector energy intensity of your own firms within your territory, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they may move outsource energy intensive production such that you get energy intensive imports and so as long as you do not tackle this. So you would think, think, have things to uh, tackle also about uh, the energy intensity of sectors that are involved in your supply chains, for example, sector-wide efficiency standards for the global level, or like for greenhouse gas emissions border tax adjustments or something, if I understood the question somehow correctly. which I hope answers the question. I think uh, it is answered. Uh, uh, one question uh, to Patrick uh, related to this uh, uh, of the footprint. Uh, uh, if uh, there is some leakage or some uh, uh, externalization of, of uh, footprint, uh, when you see uh, more efficiency, you will see that the, the supply chain uh, component uh, would uh, offset that in, uh, in, uh, efficiency gain, no? To some degree, yes. And I think if I have my bars correct in my head, we see this somehow. We have for the EU that the supply chains contribute positive to energy efficiency reduction, but the opposite was true for the footprints, right? Okay. Thank you. So if nobody uses the right to, to, to ask, uh, I think we could uh, conclude the session, isn't it? Joe hosts the, the session, so you are the... Uh, are. I think yeah. one thing, um, we should thank Brigitte for, for being volunteer to, to stand on the panel and answer all our legal questions. <laughs> well, probably I... Uh... I had one more comment. Uh, okay. On Japan film, uh, you said that non-violation complaints might be used to, to, um, um, well, bring a bring a claim uh, on uh, voluntary behavior. 
but uh, I think that uh, there's uh, no reasonable chance to uh, win a case uh, based on that. The appellate body is very uh, reluctant and uh, said that um, these kind of claims should be approached with caution and uh, remain an exceptional remedy because members do not expect to brought in front of court uh, for some uh, when they did not breach an obligation. And uh, when uh, Ms. Bandy was speaking, what came to my mind is that uh, um, often cases of uh, voluntary sustainability standards do not uh, do not address uh, uh, a wide range of uh, uh, sustainability issues, only only one. And sometimes uh, um, they are not uh, um, the in in a, in a material sense. They they just uh, it is very difficult to measure by number their uh, real contribution to to their goals. How um, how far they go in uh, in the in their requirements. Um, so um, I'm not sure whether you can uh, include this uh, in your research. Um, to, to what extent uh, they do contribute to their uh, SDGs they are linked to. And this concludes my uh, remarks. So maybe Clara wants to say something on. If I understand, understand you correctly, you 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 were referring to the um, ambition level of requirements. I think, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. So of course there can be different different levels of ambition. Yes, um, yes, that's one option. Uh, that's uh, that's a good option. And of course, also as I also mentioned, it makes sense to look at the governance of the standards. Of course, it makes a difference whether there's a third party accreditation system or whether it's just um, a, a, a laxer system for measuring compliance. So, so there are many other factors that matter um, for uh, how this plays out. And we plan to include um, the data on many of these factors actually in, in future work. So this is just a, the first basic insight. Um, but yes, this is also good food for thought. Um, and in addition to the other things that we have on our agenda, this is also something to be taken into account. So, so many things, yeah. I, I look forward to, to read your research. Okay, Octavio, I think we should probably close. Um, so you get the last word. Well, uh, <laughs> you are the host of the session, so maybe-, maybe It you could just be, go away. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, uh, thank you to everybody that uh, participated in the in the in the panel discussion. Thank you to the people who attended the, the panel discussion, and uh, I wish more people have intervened. But uh, but uh, I think uh, the the speakers they had uh, things to say to to each other. So uh, thank you to everybody. And uh, Joe, I think you can just uh, stop recording. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.